Okay, we're going to get started on the next panel. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Eucelia Wing. I am Assistant Editor of Sustainable Business at The Guardian US here in town. Um, today, we've assembled a great panel to talk about sustainable development goals. Um, and um, I'm going to start by uh, introducing our panelists briefly, and then they will um, actually talk more about what they do, and then we'll launch into our chat. Okay. So to my left is uh, Samantha Patelpino, uh, Director of Sustainable Business Initiatives at the World Resources Institute. Next is Valerie Smith, Director of Corporate Sustainability at City. And then we have Joe Swetberg, um, Coordinator of Project Spammy at Hormel Foods. And then lastly, we have Sophia Lenora Mendelssohn, Head of Sustainability at JetBlue. Welcome. And I think I'm going to ask um, each panelist to just give a brief uh, description of what you do. Um, and we'll start with that. Samantha. Great. Thanks. And hello, uh, everybody, again. Um, I'm just going to talk just a little bit about uh, the World Resources Institute for, for those in the room that may, may not be uh, so familiar with us. We are a global environmental think tank. Um, we are independent, nonpartisan. Um, we're a very science and data-driven organization. Uh, the, the main issues that we focus on are food, forests, water, climate, energy, and cities. Um, and uh, we, we are focused on uh, innovative solutions to, to tackling those uh, challenges for both current and future generations. So we're a very people-driven uh, organization that tries to bring in the environment and development aspects. Um, we have a very long history with working with the private sector, <clears throat> um, to d largely developing uh, practical tools. So I, I just want to, to list some of the tools that, uh, that WRI has developed uh, either by themselves or, or most, most often with uh, partners and quite often partners from the private sector to give you a flavor. So one of the tools that we are probably best known for is the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which we developed um, with private sector partners and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development for measuring uh, and reporting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we also have tools for uh, uh, measuring water risk. We use satellite data to, um, to be able to track uh, deforestation around the world in near real time. So companies can use those maps and that data to understand whether the commodities in their supply chain uh, are subject to, to deforestation. We've also got tools, uh, map-based tools, that help companies understand <clears throat> Excuse me. Whether they are at a risk of exposure for conflict over community land rights in, in their supply chain. So it's just a slew of tools that the WRI has to work with the private sector and help them understand where their risk exposure is and where their opportunities may be. Should I go next? Hi everybody, I'm Val Smith, I'm with City. I'm the head of sustainability for City and um, a little background on our institution. Um, we have been around for just over 200 years. We were founded in 1812 as the National City Bank of New York. Um, we have 250,000 employees. We have operations on the ground in 100 countries and we do business in 160 countries. And our institutional mission is to enable progress. So um, on the one hand, I would say that as an institution, we are perfectly positioned to help to facilitate the um, sustainable development goals. On the other hand, I think um, we'll all be talking about how you know, the sustainable development goals are something that a lot of us are still trying to wrap our arms around in terms of um, you know, the role we played in helping to get them developed and the role that we need to play in order to help forward the goals. Um, in my particular role at City, I've been here um, for 12 years now and based here in New York. And um, I look after a set of sustainability issues, but there's also a broader set of corporate citizenship issues that we as an institution work on, and I'm part of that broader corporate citizenship team. So um, I sort of interchange my corporate citizenship and sustainability hats, but um, I work a lot on environmental sustainability and human rights, and we also um, work on other different stakeholder-related issues as they come up. Um, so we'll be diving in, I think, a little bit more into the sustainable development goals and which feel most relevant to our respective institutions. <clears throat> Looking forward to that. Good morning. My name is Joe Swedberg. Um, 
I am a volunteer with Hormel Foods after 34 years as Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for the company. I retired last April. But I'm really the non-expert up here in sustainability. I lived it with the company. I, I was previous Vice President of Marketing for many years and grew up in the sales and marketing over the 34 years I was with the company. But I'm here to put it in a little different perspective. I'm going to share with you a project that I've been involved with and, and dedicating my free time now, which I live in Colorado, and I didn't move there because of the medicinal purposes. Um, <laughs> but uh, I planned that long before that. But uh, working on a, a particular project, and I'm, I can go through all the sustainable things that the Hormel does, the SDGs, which I learned the definitions about a month ago, so I'm pretty dangerous with that. But I'm going to apply those to something we're doing, and it's called Project Spammy. So Ari, you've, I've seen you smile, you think of spam. So yes, we do make spam. Um, we've had every joke in the book, but we still smile all the way to the bank after about 80 plus years with that product line. <laughs> we also have brands like Skippy, Applegate Farms, which is the largest natural and uh, organic uh, meat company. Chi Chi's, uh, Muscle Milk, a friend in body, uh, weightlifting, et cetera, holy guacamole, et cetera, so we're a little bit diverse. Um, Hormel is, 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 I feel, dwarfed to 200 years. We're 125 years old this year, uh, company. Uh, we're about one of only 20 Fortune 500 companies left in its original uh, tax since 1955 when the Fortune 500 companies came into tax. So I'm going to talk about Project Spammy, uh, which I think really uh, is, is looking at this, I want to look at this in somewhat of a global perspective. Because when you hear about this project, um, it's, it's really about helping others start to build on the SDGs. And I'm, I'm really looking at the foundation of the SDGs when I take a look at the no poverty, the zero hunger, the, the good health, quality education, and gender equality and clean water. Because if you don't have those as a basis, as you're looking at developing countries, you're not going to get to the sustainability of the SDG goals. You've got to have those as a base. And so as a food company, we've, we've created a platform through our philanthropic efforts that is really targeted towards this, and it's called Project Spammy. And this is a brainchild of our CEO about eight years ago, Jeff Ettinger, um, saw a piece on Plumpy Nut. Maybe some of you have heard about Plumpy Nut. It's a French company that's created it. It's a highly fortified peanut-based product that's used for starving children that are on their deathbed. And it's primarily distributed in Africa, and it's a for-profit company. But he thought, what can we do in a protein-based, animal-based protein? And so he really turned loose R&D, our research and development, we came up with a product that is a turkey base. We're the largest turkey processor with Jenny O Turkey Store. And it's white and dark turkey meat, and it's been fortified. Now the catch is, you can't fortify meat, fruits, or vegetables in the US. And so we had to go to the USDA and tell them, we're going to make this, but we're going to distribute this outside the US. And really, Jeff's idea was thinking about uh, disasters, food aid, et cetera. What do you do to get ahead of the curve? Because all of us have been involved in these. We donate products. We donate money uh, for Hurricane Sandy to the tsunami, Haiti, et cetera. But what can you do to try to get ahead of the curve and give these people a chance, particularly children? Because the first thousand days from conception to two-year-olds, that's where all your physical and cognitive development takes place. And if you don't take care of it then, give them the proper nutrition and food, you are not going to be able to make that up. And so we ended up creating this product that was fortified with essential nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. We ended up choosing Guatemala because it was close by, relatively. Uh, we looked at Africa, a lot of issues, long ways away. Uh, but then we had to find partners, and we found partners in Caritas, which is a Catholic relief organization. We found Food for the Poor, which is a distribution arm. And we began working with them on a very uh, small basis, delivering to their nurseries and their uh, orphanages this product. This product is only about 100 calories, but it, it is targeted with essential nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. It's almost like a, a, a bean dip. And what the beauty of it is, it mixes in with whatever their cultural diet is. So you're not changing their diet. And you're adding it in, it becomes an ingredient, so they don't even basically know it's there, but they know there's some intrinsic value to it because it's an animal-based protein. So we've been down there eight years. Um, we just received about three years ago a McGovern Dole micronutrient grant from the USDA. We were the first public company to ever receive one. 
We received it in conjunction with our partners. Uh, we did a small study uh, of children, about 160 kids, uh, in preschools and fed them uh, five mornings a week with the product mixed into five, uh, ten different recipes. We came away with uh, also doing cognitive testing. One thing about this is as you look at emerging cultures and so on, we think about delivering uh, hunger relief we uh, and food. We're delivering micronutrients, 100 calories per serving. They're getting the other nutrients from the uh, other food it mixes with. But we also did cognitive testing with this. We wanted to find out, can we move the bar? And we did this in a five-month period of time, was all. And so we found that we improved vitamin D, which is critical to uh, learning. These are three to five-year-old kids. Uh, we, we found out we moved up vitamin B12. And we found out there was a positive correlation between the delivery of vitamin D and the cognitive develop because the kids showed a significant improvement in cognitive development just over a five-month period of time. So we've got a platform on this now. We're looking at expanding that. We're on the USDA food basket. If you're not aware of that, that is a uh, approved, you have to go through a long process to get this approved. Uh, but with the USDA and people can order that, the NGOs of the world. So we're working on uh, moving that. So uh, in essence, it's, it's, uh, it's really the sweet spot for the first thousand days we're starting to look at now. Uh, it's, a, it's a great example of a public-private <coughs> partnership I think with our, our partnerships down in Guatemala with the USDA, we partnered with Tufts University, Creighton University to do some of the testing, uh, partnered with USDA, we're working with USAID in some instances and other not-for-profits. Some of our suppliers have come in and donated materials in for this project. We have set it up as a not-for-profit project within our corporation and uh, my goal is, is volunteering for this and, and I'll tell you within the next month I'm traveling three weeks out of four. Uh, on this project to various places. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's an important deal, and I think it's important in the sense that it's an opportunity to help others globally uh, get a start and give them a chance. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sophia from JetBlue Airways. Um, we are obviously an airline and one of the largest in the Caribbean and expanding throughout North America and Latin America. I am the head of sustainability, which means I work on all programs that touch natural resource consumption or externalities related to the environment. And for the sake of this panel and this conversation, I, I really bucket those into three areas. The first are what are now called science-based goals. Previously, I just called them, you know, numbers and logic. But as <laughs> Um, to use, you know, we'll use our buzzwords here. As an airline, for us, that's obviously climate change. It's critical that, as I represent this issue, that when I talk to inform groups like you guys, I want to start with that, that we are looking at our greenhouse gas footprint and actively addressing climate change. The second bucket is the customer experience. You know, did you like flying us? Was our airport nice? Could you get your organic food? Did you feel good? Did the whole experience fit into your lifestyle? And I work very hard on programs within this suite because it addresses that dreaded question, do they care? And that's the last thing anyone in this room wants to hear is that I asked the customer and they said they don't care. Right? So the idea is to stop asking if they care without telling them what we're asking about and just expressing that question to them through the customer experience. And then the third bucket is really the energy savings and the natural resource consumption reduction. And this is where I get really the, the chunk of the profit for the P&L that we keep. I mean, this is the logical lean manufacturing stuff that happens when someone comes in and looks at it from a sustainability angle. So those three areas are how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas, gas footprint while flying more people, reduce our waste while feeding more people more stuff, you know, in a metal tube at 35,000 feet. And those are the things that I think um, get this topic we all represent to the board, to the C-suite, to materiality, which are obviously the themes we've been talking about today. And that allows us, it gives us the gravitas to even sit up here and talk about UN goals. I mean, these are, these are macro economic goals set by the UN and, and we're from you know, various companies and nonprofits saying that we can help the world address them. So we need to make sure we have that meat behind the boat on it because when I speak of the UN, goal, uh, the UN 
goals or even anything at, at that level, I really talk about it as the materiality of our global economy. And to do that at the levels we want to, we have to have our own house in order. So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I think I'll start by um, asking Samantha to give us um, a description, a definition of what are sustainable development goals. Sure. Um, just me, let me just give you a quick overview. So back in 2000, the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals were launched. Um, and they were, there was only eight goals, and they covered things like poverty, universal access to primary education, um, gender equality, health, and there was one uh, goal that was very broadly addressed at uh, environmental sustainability. And those goals uh, uh, were live for about 15 years, uh, the, the, and with mixed success. I think poverty was roughly halved in, in that rate, but uh, some of the progress on, on the other goals ha ha were, were just mixed. Um, fast forward to uh, 2015, the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals just this past fall uh, by, by the UN, and there's they're quite different, so that there are 17 goals overall with 169 targets. Um, one of the key differences is that whereas the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, were developed through a top-down process, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, were developed much more through a, a bottom-up process. There was a, a highly inclusive process including conversations in low and middle income countries. Uh, the private sector was very engaged in the, in the development of these goals. Um, another thing that, that uh, separates them is that they, they cover each of the three aspects of, of uh, sustainable development. So if you, if, you look, if you go to the UN's website and you look up the SDGs and the 17 goals, you'll see that there's sort of a cluster of goals that are really around people. So it's about ending poverty, hunger, health, well-being, uh, gender equality, that sort of thing. There's a bucket of goals that, that uh, rather than, than that one goal, there's a whole bucket of goals that try to break down different aspects of environmental sustainability. So there are individual goals on climate, on oceans, on land ecosystems, and on responsible consumption and production, um, which sort of brings you around to, to the, the third pillar, which is uh, about economic prosperity. And there's a whole set of goals there around jobs, resilient infrastructure, and income inequality. So it's... Uh, my colleague to my, my left here, Val, Val said uh, just a few minutes ago when we, we were talking, you know, there's really something for everybody. It's a very wide ranging set of uh, goals established by the, the UN. Thanks, Samantha. So we have 17 goals. That, that's a lot of goals. Um, wondering how have they or will they actually shape um, your company's sustainability planning and strategies? Val, you want to take a stab at it? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think if you were a brand new company coming to these issues for the very first time that, um, and you, you know, had sort of a global footprint and business strategy, that this would be a great way to, you know, from the get-go frame up your contribution to development and society. Um, I think for, for, you know, just about every large company that has um, a good history behind it, um, the question is more how do your priorities as defined through stakeholder engagement, as defined through, you know, various materiality assessments over the years, as defined by, you know, your business core, core competencies, how do the priorities you've already established align with the goals, because there is something for everyone, um, and how can you use the goals to, you know, both inform your priorities in the future and to sort of think through different ways, you know, through different types of partnerships to actually accomplish them. Um, Does that make a difference for city? Like how city will think about its own sustainability uh, programs? I think that in certain circumstances it provides us with different people to talk to about executing on some of, some of our goals. Um, but I don't think it's going to change them. But I really think if you've done, if you've developed your, um, your sustainability strategy and goals in the right way through lots of you know, internal assessment, lots of external engagement, we've been engaging with stakeholders specifically on our corporate citizenship performance since, I mean, my records show 1997. So we've been sort of 
gathering in information from externally, listening to people when they have feedback, and sort of synthesizing that for um, close to 20 years now. Um, if we had been doing all of that, and our priorities were dramatically different than the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and we clearly wouldn't have been talking to the right people, but we go to external organizations working with World Resources Institute, working with Ceres, working with you know, our partners to understand who we should be talking to. So I think it's more of an opportunity you know, for city in particular, for I think for financial institutions, there's more of an emphasis this time around on um, the private sector as facilitators and enablers of change and progress. There's um, certainly, you know, and I, I, this is for the SDGs, but beyond, you know, looking at climate change and the Paris Agreement, there's renewed um, focus on the role that the financial sector can play. And so that brings us to the table in important ways that I think can help to, you know, drive forward progress. So Joe, um, I don't see how these new goals will make a difference or impact the uh, project SPAMI because it sounds like the program, your program has been around for a while and does it really make a difference in how you go, you know, going forward and, and planning? Yeah, I, th I think so. From Let me talk about an employee engagement aspect mm -hmm. of this. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we have a little over 20,000 employees uh, in the United States and globally. And one of the things that this has done is this is our CEO's project. I think this is going to be one of his, his key legacies uh, because he's probably got another year or two. Um, and what, what, what this is going to do, I think, from employee engagement side is they see the passion that he has for this particular project. And I think it's, it's, it's instilled with the organization. One example is we, we, four years ago, started employee engagement trips down to Guatemala. And we do four trips per year. It's a, it's a lottery now because we have so many applicants and all 20,000 plus employees are open up to this. They have to take a week of their own vacation. They have to do their own airfare down. Now they can bring spouses, family members with them. But then they're engaged for a week and we take care of the rest of that. But they're fully immersed in the project. They do some work-related projects to it. But they're also bringing down, uh, or they're asked to bring down writing materials. Uh, we donate all of our old laptops into the Caritas system, Catholic Relief Services down there. They bring uh, Legos to so the kids, and we create what's known as Chispa Centers in schools. And these centers are staying and established with that. Now, when the employees come back, in many instances, they have done their own fundraising and come back and supported these particular schools. So we're building a network within that. So I think that's uh, uh, something that you, you so many times, I think, struggle with. How do we drive these opportunities and, and get employee engagement and, and get the employees to be uh, enthused by what you're doing as a company? There are a lot of things we do that we, we think we do well. But this is one of them. But you would it, do that without the pardon? goals. You would do that without having the goals set by the UN, right? Something that your CEO has been passionate about for a while. So yes, it doesn't it, really inform. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's also changed my attitude mm -hmm. from, you know, I, I grew up in the sales and marketing side. And, you know, I, I tell people I typically marketed to relatively rational consumers. And when I moved over to the legis side, I, I marketed to irrational elected and appointed officials. So, so it's changed my mind, but, but we've started working with the government. We're in close partnership with the USDA, USAID. Uh, a lot of the NGOs look at us when we walk in somewhat skepti skeptical in re reference to you're a for-profit company, and, 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 and maybe rightfully so in some instances. But we've had to come in and, and, and let them get to know us, let them know what we're doing. So it's really helped us as a corporation and company to better understand, because quite frankly, you're working with the government, some of these things, you gotta hurry up and wait. And you know, you, most of us are used to you know, putting plans together and moving on. So it, it's really been eye-opening, and I think it's changing a lot of our culture in the sense, and I go back to those top six sustainability from the SDGs, because I, I look at, you may think, well, why does gender equality well, I've been, if you go to a third world country, the women are at the lower end of, is at the low end of the scale. It's the fathers, it's the sons, this is particularly relevant in Guatemala, the daughters, and then the mothers come last. And what we're trying to do is this product is really focused, if we really target it, towards the mothers and the unborn and the children in early development. And that's where you can make a difference. It's going to be a multi-generational effort 
but you've got to start somewhere, and the USDA is looking for innovative products, something that's new and different. And this is not rocket science. This is taking and fortifying a product that's out there. But the nice thing about this, you can adjust the fortification to address that need. Maybe in Africa, they may have different needs in, in fortification. So it's, it's really quite a unique opportunity. Yeah. I'll, I'll add on to that, I think, something that illustrates Joe's point, And I'll take Val's comments even further. Um, if you're looking to the SDGs to form your corporate responsibility platform, then I think there are a lot of people in this room who can help you and you can talk to. Because these are meant for global leadership to, to point us in the right direction. So I use the SDGs to validate what we're doing already. And, and even someone starting a platform for the first time could, could use them as a kind of like, see, I told you so tool. Look, CEO, look, I told you everyone also cares about this. And, and they're almost you know, building blocks to point how all these issues work together. And what's brilliant about these from the corporate point of view is that you don't have to just pick gender equality. You don't have to just pick poverty. And what's so important to me, it's not environment or social. What they got right this time was integrating social as, uh, you know, excuse me, integrating environment into social. We are doing this for the environment to save the planet, to save the people. And, and you take out that kind of tension be between those two issues. That's how it helps me the most in a corporate setting. I guess what's not clear to me is whether these goals really add any pressure for companies to do more or to start doing something. So it sounds like a lot of companies have already been doing something for a while. They'll continue doing it, and they can certainly um, match what they're doing to the different goals. Um, so is that the purpose, basically? So like, oh, we're doing, hey, look at the 17 goals, and we're doing this and that. Isn't that great? Or are we looking at these goals as a way to try to get the companies to nudge them to do more? And yeah, found that, uh, just, yeah. just, just a, an observation on that. You know, I, I think that um, the sustainable development goals ha have um, a, a lot of value. And I think this point about um, <laughs> being able to point to this, this larger global framework and using that to validate what a company is doing is enormously important for bringing along a whole suite of decision makers that, that, that you need to bring along on that journey. So I think that's, that's incredibly important. I also think it's, it's uh, another issue is that um, you know, many, of the, many, of the, um, many of the resources that we're using are in fact shared resources. Um, if you take a look at water, for example, your impacts on water are very, very locally specific. You can't talk about that in global terms. It's very specific to the watershed. Um, and so, you know, if, if you as a company have met your goals, you may not have actually moved the needle for that watershed at all if the other users of that watershed haven't come along. So in order to actually make progress, you need to be able to talk to other stakeholders, to policymakers, other water users in, in this case. And having sort of a common language around what you're striving for, I think, can be incredibly valuable and powerful. So th those, those are sort of, I, I think, some, some quite strong points. But I do have to say, the flip side of this, though, is that if companies, um, I mean, and there is, there is an enormous um, expectation uh, that the private sector, that companies will be able to go a long way in helping to meet the sustainable development goals. Um, I don't think you can really look to the public sector as the solution providers. It's the private sector that the solution providers, whether that's finance or whether it's technologies or whether it's leveraging supply chains and all that, all that sort of thing. So there's this great expectation on the private sector. If, if at the end of the day, in 15 years from now, if all we are able to say is that companies have taken what they were doing anyway and mapped it to the sustainable development goals, then we won't have made enough progress. So I do think that there, there is a, a little bit of a call here for companies, uh, as they get to that part of their process where they are perhaps re-evaluating their, their next set of strategic goals, to not just align them sort of thematically with, with the sustainable development goals, but are, are, are the goals that they are setting for themselves, do they align with the sort of the scale of ambition in, in, this, in the sustainable development goals? Could you say that, you know, if, if all companies, 
you know, set, set a target of this level of ambition, then we would go a really long way to achieving this goal. So I do think there is a little bit of a call for uh, not just aligning thematically, but also aligning sort of with the, the scale of ambition of, of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and one last thing I'll, I'll say on the topic is, you know, the, the, the SDGs, um, we, we can talk about them um, as, as a UN process, as a framework, um, and, and it, it, feels, it, feels, it feels quite abstract. Mm -hmm. It feels quite abstract. But the, the Sustainable Development Goals really are a reflection of the world that we live in. Um, and it's quite telling that we even need to have a global process that says, hey, let's get rid of poverty. Let's get rid of hunger. You know, but there, there are some real challenges in our world. You've got more than a billion people that still live in water scarce areas. You've got only 15% of the world's forests that are still intact. Okay, we've got millions of people that live in poverty. By 2030, so 15 years from now, we will have grown the middle class from just under 2 billion people to roughly 5 billion people. That's an enormous success story. <clears throat> enormous success story. Um, that also means a lot in terms of um, opportunity for companies. That's a lot of spending power with that growing global middle class, huge opportunity for companies. But that also says a lot about what does that mean for how you change your, um, your strategies because that also means a lot more consumption of the vital resources that, that we're all dependent on. So, so having a, a little bit of a step change in how we think about goals, I think, is very necessary to this sort of global journey that we've sort of put ourselves on. Any thoughts on whether the, the goals challenge companies to do more, do better, or you just know, I, nice to have? I, I think you hit the nail mm -hmm. on the head that this has to be about scale. But I, I have to push back when asked, are we doing anything because of the SDGs? No, we're doing things because these are good for our business, just like my marketing colleagues do, just like my finance colleagues do. And it's so important that we keep that rhetoric up among ourselves because as experts on this topic, we cannot expect to be taken seriously at the board level if we don't have that right in our own group. So I guess I maintain you know, my previous stance that we use business-based decisions to, to set our actions and use the global UN goals as a way to tie in what we're doing to the larger trends in the macro economy. Uh, going back to something Samantha said uh, about the, the global growth we're going to experience, and I heard one gentleman say, you know, we're basically looking at two more Chinas by 2050 to feed, and how are we going to do that? You know, so you're looking at close to three billion more people on this planet. So that kind of opens your eyes. And plus, we're already looking at around 800 plus, close to 900 million people that are going to bed hungry in different levels of, of uh, malnutrition uh, as we speak globally. So how are you going to do that? You're going to add three more billion, and you got 800 million now. So this, this I think, stirs us all to be thinking about how do we do things differently than we've done before. We've got to start thinking differently. We've got to start, and if I keep going back to, because I'm, I'm dealing and kind of looking at the food aid issue, you know, we're doing a lot of great, the United States does more for food aid globally than anybody. We're out trying to help countries be sustainable themselves. We're sending food aid over. But a lot of that hasn't changed over the years. So we need to look at innovative ways and how we can be more sustainable and efficient. And we think this is one way by taking an ounce and a half of white and dark turkey meat and fortifying it, 100 calories, and adding it to diets, we think we can start making some differences. Now, we're not the only ones that can think that way. There are others. There are other things taking place out there. But that tells me that's a sustainability story right in itself. But the other side of that is we better be willing to partner when we go into these countries. Because we went into Guatemala. We had no clue about the Guatemalan culture. We're pretty good at marketing here in the US. But we ended up picking and went through Dunn and Bradstreet to try to find out who would be the best partners to help us through this process. And we found Food for the Poor out of Miami, which are primarily focused on Central America and being able to know that culture and send in food and products to that group, and then Caritas, the Catholic Relief Services down there. 
we would not be anywhere. This project would have failed completely if we've not gone in and found partners. Now, I go into some groups and different agencies and the government agencies, and they're kind of shocked that you partnered with somebody in, in those countries. That's just common sense. We had no clue about the culture, but we've learned a lot from them. And, we, and, it's, and so this model shows you that when we expand into other countries in Central America or globally, we better darn well find the right partners to be able to do that. And, and that's what we're going to have to do. And, and I think that sets a pretty good model for globally and the commitment to be able to do that. We have no written agreements with them at Caritas. They say companies come in and have wanted to do partnerships in the past. Well, they come in and test something and then they leave. They have a verbal agreement from our CEO that we're, we're there and we're there to serve you, and we are. We've donated every bit of product in there for the last eight years. We just can't feed the world on ourselves, on our own. So we're looking at taking this now beyond as a not-for-profit portion to do that, but a commitment that also makes a big difference. I think I'll just round out the discussion. Um, I, I definitely don't think that it's about um, the United Nations or the Sustainable Development Goals putting new pressure on companies. I mean, it, it's only recently that I think companies have really felt welcomed into the different processes of the United Nations. There's Obviously, the UN Global Compact, which is um, you know a compact from the United Nations designed at corporate responsibility, corporate sustainability, and upholding certain principles. Um, but the Millennial Develop Millennium Development Goals weren't necessarily inclusive of business. And I think one of the controversial things about the SDGs was that the private sector was brought in early on as one of the entities to inform the development of the goals. But the fact that that's controversial and the fact that the United Nations, you know, the way that the, way that the culture is, the way the meetings are run, and I say this as a member of the board of the UN Global Compact here in the United States, so I say this as an insider, it's very different than the way a meeting would be or an event would be in the private sector. So I think what, what I think is important, first of all, I think the sustainable development goals are sort of a reflection of the shift that we're already seeing in the private sector, which is, you know, over a decade ago, we were all, I think, looking very internally, okay, how can I make my own operations as a company 5% more efficient than the previous year? And then we saw this shift to the private sector, not just thinking about keeping its own house in order, but thinking about sustainability and our contributions as global citizens through a business lens. This is really about you know, smart business, it's about developing business opportunity with clients. And I think that remains the cornerstone. There's a third sort of element here, which I think you know, for companies like the ones represented here is around um, our role as global citizens. So I think we're increasingly seeing, you know, our goals are going to be business focused, but they're also going to be using external reference points. They're using science to form greenhouse gas reduction goals. We'll be looking at the sustainable goal, development goals as we think about our broader corporate citizenship goals. So I think this sort of, you know, bringing in the external viewpoint closer to the private sector viewpoint is going to be really important. When I look across the sustainable de development goals, um, you know, there are basically all of them feel relevant to us in one way or another because we bank all of the sectors in the room. Um, but I think almost the most important one is the one that feels like a little bit of an afterthought and that's I think number 17, <laughs> partnerships. Because when I think about the opportunity for the SDGs to possibly create space to do things a little bit differently. I think about, um, you know, convenings like the one we had last year, the Financing for Development Conference in Ethiopia that Citigroup was a part of, that brings together, you know, development institutions, um, private sector, you know, different entities together into the room to talk about how to do things differently. I was in Brazil last week um, at a Financing Sustainable Cities Forum where um, we had a number of people from different cities around the world talk about sort of the real world and very simple barriers to development for their cities. And, you know, what the city of Boston can do is different 
than what the city of Durban can do, which you know at least has some access to capital markets, that's different than what the city of Rio can do. So I think that just creating spaces to bring together different parties that aren't used to problem solving together could end up being one of, one of the important legacies of the SDGs. I think the ambition here is to be able to meet all those goals by 2030, is that right? So that's not a lot of uh, time to do this, um, but I believe the expectations that now that um, the businesses were involved in, in creating these goals, we should see more private business um, investments in realizing the goals as well. Um, could you guys talk about what are some of the financing mechanisms or how do you think companies go about actually um, securing a larger budget, um, you know, finding different ways to, to uh, raise that investment aside from using their balance sheet to, to achieve some of the goals that they want to see? Do you want me to yes. tackle that first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think some of the tried and true tried and true forms of financing are going to continue to be extremely relevant. Um, you know, I, I believe that the key, to, um, the key to financing the sustainable development goals, and there's something like, um, so 4.5 trillion needed for the SDGs, and there's currently 1.5 per year, and so there's a gap of 3 trillion. I think these numbers are so big that they're just rough estimates. Um, I think probably the key is a tool which we're already able to use very effectively in the United States, which is just to make use of capital markets and all of the investor um, desire that's out there for financing development, for financing sustainability. And I think, um, you know, and so if you look globally, there are a lot of places in the world that don't yet have access to local and global capital markets. And um, you know, to gain access to local and global capital markets requires basic things like um, you know, transparency, and um, you know, being able to demonstrate that you are um, a viable entity, whether you're a company or a city. Um, but I think that you know, apart from the broader capital markets issue, that um, you know, that there are a lot of initiatives underway to help push forward. You could look at tools um, that are sort of macro and micro. Um, green bonds is one tool that gets a lot of play, um, certainly in the United States and Western Europe. And I think it is, uh, it's such a new tool that I think um, its, its promise is still yet to be fulfilled. But um, whether you're looking at green bonds or sort of the more nascent social impact bonds, the idea that you as a development bank or a private company could issue a bond that basically looks like your plain vanilla bond, whether it's a municipal bond or a corporate bond, but is, um, is designed specifically for a use of proceeds that is, say, green or social. I think that has been somewhat of a game changer in that it helps companies to understand that investors are very interested in this space and in putting their money into this space. And what we've seen from green bond issuances is that um, it, apart from the PR value that it has for the issuer, um, it also brings new investors to the table and these, these bonds tend to be oversubscribed. So there's a lot of promise there. I think the other thing that we are working a lot on is there's a need for a transition um, of the financing model to, you know, we still have a lot of large things that we help to finance. But I think if we're looking at meeting some of these sustainable development goals, we have to look at how to finance smaller things. Um, the bankability of what we finance is not going to change. We're going, like, we're going to need to finance things of a certain size and scale or it won't make sense for a company like Citi. But what we're doing is figuring out ways to bundle up energy efficiency upgrades or bundle up distributed solar in a way that um, we can then bundle and sell to investors. So I think you know, we see some early promise of new tools, whether it's the big green bonds or the little things getting financed in a new way, that, um, that do show some, some promise for doing things differently and getting some of this done. Okay. And Joe, um, what's the budget for program spamming, and do you rely mostly on public funding for it? Uh, yeah, we've, we've uh, donated multi-million dollars over the last eight years um, mm -hmm. into the project. And, uh, so it's it's a uh, 
it's a it's our biggest part of our philanthropic effort as a company, and we're focused on, of course, Guatemala right now, but looking to expand beyond that. But going back to something you were talking about earlier too is is uh, we're in a global economy, we're in a global society. Just think, and you watch the news this morning, how many things globally are impacting us, and particularly when you look at our security. And you take a look around the globe, where does a lot of the insecurity happen is when there is a lack of food, nutrition, education. And those people that are trying to change those cultures are the ones that are, 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 are trying to block the opportunity for food, education, because it gives them control. I think back to, uh, some of you may know him, Ambassador Ken Quinn, he heads up the World Food Prize out of Des Moines, but that's a, a Norman Borlaug Institute that was started. Norman Borlaug, if you don't know, was credited with saving a million lives globally uh, from his wheat, uh, uh, from the different types of wheat he was able to grow and, and provide food for people. But Ambassador Quinn was the ambassador in Cambodia in 1992 when the Khmer Rouge uh, was, was fell in that country and one of the most brutal dictators ever. And one of the things that Ken had a six million dollar budget he talks about, he went in and focused all of that on roads. And you may ask why did he do that, focusing on roads? Because so many of the people in Cambodia were, were, were isolated by the Khmer Rouge and that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to isolate those people they wanted to make them food insecure, and they wanted to not educate them, so they had complete control. And you think, look, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, that's what's happening in some of those areas. They're so isolated. He built roads in the country, and he's probably credited with doing some of the most important things to be able to allow for the transfer of not only goods and services, but knowledge back and forth. And those are the type of things I think we have to look at globally. We can live here and live quite comfortably in that. But this world's changing awfully quick. And I, again, go back to you got three billion more people coming on. How are we going to deal with that? I guess, um, Joe, the reason I ask about um, funding, because I know um, some of the, I guess, the sort of well-known criticism about corporate philanthropic um, efforts is, well, it's nice when you have it, but if, if the funding is gone or if the CEO retires, you know, it's this passion project, but mm -hmm. once he's gone, how do you make sure that it's going to be sustainable, like it's going to continue that program? You know, yeah. if, where would the funding come from? Well, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Since uh, Jeff, our CEO, has been passionate about this project, I talked before about the employee engagement portion of it. It's become a part of our corporation. We have a lot of, of, of customers now that have become engaged with this, but um, I would venture to say our employees have raised uh, several hundred thousand dollars in investing down there. And so what he's done is built a cornerstone on our foundation. It's provided a passion for our employees, and this is something that's not going to go away. And so you may be able to tell I, I, I believe in this project, and as I'm volunteering my time on it, I, I truly do. I think it's something that's quite unique and special haven't seen anybody in the world doing anything quite like this. And so I think that's the basis. It takes the top leadership and when the transition, and I know the, the person that's coming in and transition, he's a, a good friend, this person will carry it on. And so it, it takes that type of commitment, but Jeff's also laid the foundation within the organization for the employees. They got 20,000 employees that aren't gonna let them forget. Mm -hmm. And Sophia, anything to add about the financing? Yeah, I, I think. Mm -hmm. sorry, thank you. Um, I think Valerie really hit it right. And to your original question about how are we going to do anything by 2030, so it's it's the market improvement in investor desire and appetite that we've seen increase in the past couple of years, and that gives me hope we'll make a dent in any of these one goals by 2030. With goal 13 around climate change, which I'm obviously most focused on, that's where I see the investor desire changing, and you can see the technology improving immediately after that. I mean, there's almost only a six month to one year lag in the increase in desire and startups and new tech ventures coming to JetBlue offering solutions for further investing. Okay. So we're going to open up to actually Q&A from the audience. Any questions? <coughs> uh, hi. Th thank you for, uh, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, go back to the SDGs. It's about goals and targets and, and, and a 
deadline, which is like coming very soon. Um, so you mentioned your sustainability strategies, of course, align, and I think a lot of companies aligned with the, with the S17 goals, but do these targets, did they influence your agenda on how your own targets in your company for reducing equalities, for access to uh, water, or did, did that influence us or give you more ambitious uh, or give you more leverage internally to, to have very ambitious targets for your own company? Um, <laughs> well, just just brief, just quickly. So, um, about a year ago, in early 2015, we announced a new sustainability strategy, and just focused on environmental sustainability. We have um, three pillars: um, environmental finance, so our financing of renewable energy, um, sustainable transportation, etc. We have our second pillar of environmental and social risk management, and this is around our work with our clients to make sure that. Um, the work we finance with them is able to meet international standards. And the third area is our own operations and supply chain. So we, over the course of a process that took over a year, involved a lot of internal and external stakeholder engagement, had developed goals for each of those three pillars. Um, our primary goal, I guess similar to Sophia, um, the top priority of the sustainability strategy is around climate change, which we view through both a risk lens and an opportunity list, as well as keeping our own um, house in order. So we have a um, $100 billion environmental finance goal, which is around our work with clients, our participation in what's frankly an exploding renewable energy market. Um, in 2014, which is the first year counted toward the goal, we participated in $23.6 billion um, worth of environmental finance activity with our clients around the world. We're going to be um, announcing our 2015 contributions in our, in our citizenship report, which comes out at the end of this month. Um, and I'll say that 2015 was an even bigger um, contribution toward that goal. So we're all of a sudden faced with this dilemma of a $100 billion goal in 10 years feeling like it was too conservative, which is sort of a nice problem for the world to have. Um, but, you know, the goals, we're now on our third generation of operational goals. We now have science-based greenhouse gas reduction goals, um, environmental and social risk goals, environmental finance goals. I think, you know, more importantly is when we look to develop the next set of goals, we'll be looking, I think, at the level of ambition from the SDGs and figuring out how does our activity tie in with these global objectives and how can we use that to push ourselves? I mean, again, very well said. And I think the consensus from the panel are these, these are guiding, these are encouraging. Um, at least for me, we're not quite going to get the answer, yes, because these are the SDGs, so therefore. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if 2025 rolls around and you see an increased pressure at the UN level, at the head of state level, um, kind of merging with the, the current pressure we see coming after COP21, and then you get some specific numbers. But I, I've I got to keep pushing back and say, if the UN were represented up here, I don't think they'd want to hear that companies say, oh, yeah, we're, we, we form these and we're basing all our targets on these. These aren't just for us. Yeah, um, just this, Jane Maddenberg and Mark Seller, a, a comment or two um, and, a, and a question. And I completely agree. Having worked at the World Bank when the MDGs were developed, you know, these, are na these were national goals. And I still think for the most part they are. And it's also, to your point, yes, the corporate sector, the private sector is involved much more and it is more the implementation and how do we achieve those goals rather than having those individual goals for, or the goals for individual corporations. Um, and also I think we need to remember these, you know, the SDGs were just passed last September. So let's put some context in there about what they can do and what they can't do. Relatively speaking, the MGG, MDGs were pretty successful. Nobody thought in 2000, that 2015, any of those goals would have been met, and a, a good portion of them, them were. Um, so what I'm taking out of this conversation, though, is for corporations, for me it's a language issue, and it's, my, it's, it's this um, an ability to inform the discussion and help ha corporations have the discussion with the UN or the World Bank or the other multi, you know, the other financiers. Um, and that there's some common language that we've been lack lacking or that you can talk to NGOs about that. Um, so that's my takeaway. I was wondering if, you know, do you agree with that or do you think, no, that's really 
not not helpful at all. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mentioned earlier that with regards to working with NGOs and some of the government agencies, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new experience for some of us in the sense that uh, it, it's kind of like you're in an early, early stages of a date, dating, and they're just getting to know each other. And I said before, many times I felt when I went into the NGOs and so on, they kind of step back and, you know, you're for profit, what are you doing here? Uh, there's got to be some kind of an angle. So there is some, some skepticism with regards to that. But I'll tell you what, you just got to go in and you got to have conversations with them and you got to have continual conversations with them. And I, I think about the, the, the relationships we've started to build with in the USDA, with the uh, State Department through USAID and others, and with some of the NGOs. Uh, it, it's a process. And, but I'll tell you what, neither one of us can do this by ourselves. And I think everybody's starting to realize these partnerships are of great value. And when we got the, the grant from the McGovern Dole, it was only $114,000. That was, they, were, they were giving out $10 million in grants that year. They gave out six grants. We found out we had the highest rated grant because it was a relatively short human intervention process, $114,000. They came back and said, we got to give you $125,000 because you can't voluntarily use your money to ship product down to get into the country. But that's, that's what it was. And the reason we did it was the money was nice, but uh, it was the credibility with something like that So in building relationships. So it, it takes time. But if you don't do it, 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 it's going to take more of these type of partnerships, public-private, because there's not the funding. Nobody can do it on their own. Go ahead. Oh, where's the? Oh, nice. I, I, okay. So I think you and I are probably going to say the same thing, actually. Um, one of the pieces that we hear a lot from um, companies is around how do you measure against the um, SDGs and how do you. Um, and I agree, actually, I think the common language is a tremendous opportunity with the SDGs, but then also how do you take existing corporate strategy, how do you take potential corporate strategy and, and demonstrate linkage? And I, so I want to just plug, I don't know if any of you have used it, but um, GRI and UNGC and World Business Council for Sustainable Development developed a tool called the SDG Compass. And what it does is it maps the SDGs and their 169 indicators underneath them with the um, existing reporting tools like the G4, like CDP, like UNGCs. And so whatever existing reporting tool you may already use, you can, it's a great way to see initially where you're already contributing towards the SDGs, and then it also allows you an easier way to report against them at the time when you choose to do so. And I think for companies who kind of see 17 SDGs and then the 169 indicators, it becomes overwhelming, but a lot of the work has already been done for you to kind of map, and I just, I guess, Part of it was a statement, and then also a question of have any of you used the tool, and is, is that something that's useful? We haven't used it, and I think that's a function of these being released in September, as someone said. I can't see who has the microphone next. Oh, okay. Um, Susan Ray Ross from USAID. You've talked a lot about the financial and the economic, and those have very clear metrics, and it's very clear how that affects business bottom line. But I'm wondering, a lot of times what we're struggling with is what, what would be considered more social, whether it's women's empowerment or, and companies are starting to think about how to get women involved in their supply chains, but where the science isn't as much, a lot of that really still falls under the philanthropy bandwidth. And the question is, how do we actually get that integrated, whether it's in ethical sourcing departments, because that's what's gonna make it sustainable. So I, I wonder if you could comment on that. I, um, well, I can, I can comment on a piece of that, which is um, to say that something that we did differently with our $100 billion environmental finance goal, and we came to this through um, talking externally and sort of, you know, asking for help solving this problem externally. Um, and our starting point was to go into, um, you know, a room, a meeting, and say, you know, how many billion dollars do you think our new goal should be? I mean, the goal was 
frankly built from the ground up by sort of canvassing business by business. But we started with um, a framing of we had a previous $50 billion climate finance goal. We met it three years early. We need to set a new goal. What should it be? And something that came out of these early discussions was the fact that, I mean, the money, that measurement is really important because there's an understanding that finance is so crucial to development, but that what people really wanted to know was the impacts of that financing. So we've been trying to um, sort of draw some learnings from the impact investing space into our work. Um, and it's different because we're really not talking about the impacts of our financing. We're talking about some of the early outcomes, outputs of the activities that our clients are doing that we are helping to facilitate. So it's very indirect and we try to be careful about how we talk about it. But when we release our citizenship report on April 26th, we'll be talking about our 2014 and 2015 participation toward the $100 billion goal. And we'll also be talking about the environmental and social benefits associated with a subset of that financing. And that will include trying to tease out, you know, jobs supported, water provided, um, public transit, um, you know, pr supported. So I think we are starting to try to change the framing away from the language of just, you know, finance and dollars into the, the framing of um, what are we as companies through our client and our clients doing to help support benefit to society. Next question. Oh. Can I, oh, can I add on oh, briefly? Um, so for technology firms, whether it's you know Google and Black Girls Code or, or aviation, I think the answer to solving that problem is an awkwardness. <laughs> and that awkwardness is coming out through the materiality and the reporting that we talked about this morning. It's awkward when only 2% of pilots are female and 60% or majority percent of your, your customers are female. It's, it's going to be through that brand reflection. Good point. Tim Moen from AMD. Um, great conversation. Thank you. And I think most of the conversation has been mapping to the SDGs. And, you know, mapping is wonderful, but it's not, I think, where we want to go. We want to actually create new action, right, for, for the SDGs. So my question is really about collaboration and public-private partnerships, because there's no single company that can do this alone. These are, these are goals that are very large and sweeping goals that really are focused on governments primarily. Um, so how do companies collaborate within their sector or with governments to move the needle on the SDGs? Well, I can just speak from my experience. Um, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta get in front of it. You just gotta get with people and start having that conversation. Um, you know, one thing when I was heading up our legislative affairs, one thing I always tried to do was to go into the legislator's office get to know their staff, get to know who they are, but also to let them get to know who we were. And one of the things I've always led with since I was involved since Project Spammy, I talked about this project. I came in, it was a, it was a door opener, just to show them that, hey, they're, this is an interesting thing, they're doing something right. So I think that that's the type of thing you have to do is, is you may not be able to get to the leadership in that organization, but you start building by getting into that uh, office or whoever you're calling on, uh, whether it's a governmental or an NGO or, or um, another partner, private, and start talking to those people. And, and it's, it's pure marketing. It's sharing who are you and what are you here for and, and what can you do for them. And I think once you start uh, eliminating some of those obstacles with the skepticism, you're from the private sector, uh, you know, it's like you're from the government, I'm here to help. Uh, I'm from the private sector, and I'm here to help. And how can we do something like that together? And it, it's 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 not rocket science. It's just you know starting to open up doors, talk to people, and start to build relationships. And you won't do that maybe with one meeting. It's going to take multi meeting. It might take years. But if we don't do it, because just take a look at where the uh, the money is these days. How much duplication is out there, or how much is not getting funded that should get funded? And by collaborating with a public-private uh, enterprise, uh, that can start to open up some doors, because otherwise, uh, we're not going to get to where we need to be. Actually, one last question here. Th 
thanks Helvang Jorgensen and actually right now for Global Compact Network Canada. Um, so I, if I may just give a little bit of insight from what, what we're doing in, in Canada. And I love all your comments and I fully agree. Um, but in, in, from a Canadian setting, so we have the, the UN Global Compact Network. We have over 100 leaders and we are actually talking a lot about the SDGs. We had the government of Canada um, helping us to put a national round table together. We had a lot of insight from a lot of people in, in, in that respect, talking about public-private partnerships, talking about how these different companies could work together. And we have workshops where the companies together, Air Canada is part of it, and banks, etc., um, to actually how to start using this both as part of what they're already doing. So we, we made surveys to say what are they already doing and, and what are the issues that they could be doing. And I fully agree in terms of like these are something that many of the companies have been doing for a long, a long time. But at the same time, there are some new issues. And I was just looking at, at a survey that was made globally and actually the CEOs are those in companies that are most aware of the sustainable development goals. And I think that is a tool that when I'm going out and talking to board of directors, they are more aware of the sustainable development goals. And it's, it's a good way to start that discussion. Um, so I think we can, we can use it, uh, the sustainable development goals, to actually push that and to get companies to work together. So it's not only public-private partnerships, but also private-private <laughs> partnerships, etc. Um, so there's a lot of things going on at the moment. Last thing is, in terms of, of the financial, uh, convergence was just set up on a global scale. It's almost like matchmaking for SDG-related projects and finance. So anybody that have any projects, or for that sake, finance, to put into that could go to convergence. I think it's convergence.com or something like that. So, um, Any questions, though, for our panelists on that? Sorry. Uh, um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, thank you very much. Um, please uh, give hands to our panelists.